No, no, thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, just to confirm, I've got, I understand I've got about 20 minutes to speak and then I'll leave about 10 minutes so we can take questions and have a short discussion before I pass the floor on to Arif, who has a very complimentary um, presentation um, on this whole issue. So we'll have about an hour, I see, to uh, discuss the issue of the Dayton framework and constitution more broadly. Just to make sure, can everyone hear me okay? Is the volume all right? Excellent, okay. <clears throat> Um, no, thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to join for some of the previous sessions. It seems that it's a lot harder to sort of sneak out of other obligations sometimes when you're not in, in person, but I'm happy to be here today. And, and what I really want to do is to try to build on some of the issues Nana just mentioned in terms of explaining and sort of detailing the broader context of how we got to the Dayton uh, peace talks uh, what people thought Dayton should have been and hoped it might be, and, and why it mattered, uh, not just in terms of uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, but in terms of some of the broader elements of international um, uh, engagement, human rights promotion, and democratization strategies. Um, sitting here in 2020, it's really easy for young people in particular to forget or to not even know that 20 years ago, was a time of a lot of optimism in terms of trying to um, end wars, um, end suffering, and then to try to in, engage and intervene to sort of spread values of democratic open societies and human rights-based societies. Um, and, and the early and mid 90s was a period of time when there was a sense that the notion of a liberal peace or a democratic peace uh, was ascendant. Um, was it ever perfect? No. I mean, we can have another discussion about some of the political versus economic values and approaches. Um, but there was a time when a lot of people, including me, got, got involved in these issues because we really did think that there was an opportunity to, to spread uh, open society uh, values more broadly. And, and I say that because since 2015, 2016, We've seen so many negative turns and so many, um, so much backtracking away from these values, particularly in the past uh, couple of years, that it's it's easy to forget that there was a time where um, this was a bit more taken for granted, and it was in that environment when when the war was really ended and then Dayton was unfolded and began to be implemented. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you and work through a, some PowerPoint slides. Let me just make sure that this works okay. <clears throat> and uh, look at what really, uh, look at some of the progress that was made and then the decline and explain why that happened in the international role. And then look at some of the lessons uh, that we can learn, not just in terms of uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina and the region, but in terms of international uh, state strengthening, peace building, uh, conflict management uh, efforts in, in general. And I won't go into a lot of the details on some of the constitutional challenges because I know Arif will be framing this in his presentation and that he's got some excellent perspectives on that. But, but I'm going to try to look at this in, in a bigger picture uh, way. <clears throat> Um, when, when you think about, I mean, and I know you've been talking about um, Yugoslavia, the dissolution of Yugoslavia, uh, genocide and human rights uh, issues for the past several days, but I just want to emphasize again that when the, the Cold War ended and we started to see the, the wall come down and the Soviet Union disintegrate and, and this, this really big geopolitical shift happened, the, there was a real post-Cold War euphoria that led to a policy vacuum uh, that really hit the former Yugoslavia particularly hard. Um, because there was not yet either really a, a complete and sufficient understanding of what was going on in the ramifications, nor an ability, uh, really an effective ability to try to prevent or forestall some of the uh, biggest negative consequences that from the very beginning were evident. Um, it was too easy for Westerners, for Western governments to try to frame the whole dissolution of Yugoslavia as one of ancient ethnic hatreds. And, and this narrative really became dominant in, in the public media um, and including on CNN, which really got its start as a 24-hour news network and framed the opinions of a lot of people watching the news unfold 
uh, from, from the very beginning. Um, and this is extremely frustrating because we know more and more about just what analysts and just what politicians knew um, from the very beginning in terms of the power games underway uh, in Yugoslavia, which demonstrated that it was definitely not a bottom-up uh, dissolution and movement, but was very much um, a result of top-down manipulation in politics. Um, I think that the uh, Glarditch book, The Hour of Europe, does an extremely good job of explaining just what in particular they knew in Washington, D.C. at the time based on intercepts of communications uh, through intelligence services especially, where analysts could see that this was very much about power, uh, power allocation, uh, resource allocation, etc., and was not a grassroots movement uh, in, in any way. And because of this, and because of the vacuum, both in terms of policy options uh, in Washington, in London, in Brussels, in other European capitals, there were a lot of missed opportunities for prevention. Uh, when we saw the very short-lived war happen in Slovenia and then be followed by the longer uh, war in Croatia and then ultimately in Bosnia, there were a number of times where intervention would have been possible. Uh, first, in Croatia, in terms of a stronger um, response to the bombing of Dubrovnik, the uh, shelling of Vukovar and the civilian casualties with both, um, but then also some ideas that had been mooted even earlier about putting peacekeepers in preventively in Bosnia, which were unfortunately roundly rejected uh, in Washington and, and by others. And, and the failure to respond more coherently and in a joint way from the beginning allowed for the facts on the ground to change quite quickly, uh, both in terms of the, um, basically, the, uh, the, the seizure of about a third of Croatian territory by Serbian forces, uh, which was maintained until the summer of 1995. And then, perhaps most brutally, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, as we saw the country begin to, basically, uh, be torn apart. Um, the, the changing facts on the ground was rapid and was critical. And Robert Donia, in his book on Radovan Karadzic, does a very good idea, uh, job of explaining how this happened. Um, and once the, eth the initial ethnic cleansing unfolded, the battle lines more or less stayed pretty firm for a good chunk of the war. And it slipped into a stalemate, which was unfortunately um, terrible for the civilian population and made progress in terms of peace negotiations um, hard to move forward as different agendas settled in. Um, there were different alliances that came up in different localized ways. Uh, in 1994, we saw the Washington Agreement uh, be agreed to sort of end the fighting between the Croat and Bosniak forces in particular, uh, most notably symbolized by the destruction of Mostar. Um, and this made it more strategically possible to find a way to uh, change the military equation across Bosnia-Herzegovina as a whole, as there was a decision that having the two sides together fighting against the army of the Republika Srpska uh, would be a military advantage. Um, in, in, as we moved into 1995, we started to see a number of different pieces fall into place, which ultimately helped to sort of um, speed an end to the very long war. Uh, the, the fall of Srebrenica, which you've been studying quite a bit, um, the onset of Operation Storm, and another shelling of Sarajevo and Markola all happened within a short time frame um, over the summer of 1995. And this combined with uh, some different dynamics domestically in the United States related to President Bill Clinton and his looking forward in terms of election, re-election prospects um, came together to create an environment in which the Americans were suddenly more interested in trying to hasten an end to the war and negotiate a peace. So in fairly rapid order after a three and a half year war, we saw some targeted uh, NATO bombing of uh, Serb positions in and around Sarajevo and elsewhere, uh, a ceasefire that was put into place in late September and October, and then ultimately the holding of peace talks in Dayton, Ohio, which was quite an odd 
choice for many after years of failed peace talks in places like Paris and Geneva and elsewhere. Um, but this was seen as really a way of the Americans taking ownership of this. It's playing a leading role, sidelining the Europeans in the peace talks and was really aimed at trying to sort of uh, sequester the various parties to the peace talks on an Air Force base in the middle of nowhere in Dayton, Ohio, to force uh, negotiations and ultimately a peace agreement. Uh, Richard Holbrook's book on the peace agreement talks is quite often written in a very self-serving way, which isn't to be a surprise, but it also really does um, give a good um, explanation of the dynamics of the talks uh, between the main parties who were from Bosnia-Herzegovina and then Croatia and Serbia. And <clears throat> What was interesting is that throughout the peace talks, 90% of the discussions were uh, focused on maps, on which piece of territory would be held by which of the various factions. It wasn't institutions. And unfortunately, the emphasis on maps and territory um, has been something that has led to consequences that we're dealing with until today. And we can talk about that a bit more a bit later. Um, I think it's always interesting to note that while Annex 1 of the peace agreement was the military stabilization element in terms of security and securing the peace and allowing for the insertion of NATO peacekeepers, etc., cetera, um, the rest of the constitution was much more of the blueprint for building the state. And this included uh, the constitution of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which was Annex 4. And, and I think that just the fact that Annex 4 is not <laughs> included the constitution as opposed to annex one is telling because it wasn't the number one priority the number one priority of the people and the parties negotiating were on the security elements not on the broader state building state strengthening elements um, it's also important to note that the BIH constitution within Dayton was adopted after the entity constitutions had been developed, both for the Republika Srpska and the entity of the Federation of Bosnia Herzegovina. And this can be seen as really like an exercise of building the roof after you've already established the walls and the foundation. And this has been a structural problem that we've dealt with now for nearly a quarter of a century. Um, the Dayton Agreement was unique in the sense that it did intend for both a military and a civilian oversight um, process to ensure the peace implementation. Um, at first, there was a very over-optimistic vision that this would be finished within a year. Uh, this was based uh, not at all on the facts on the ground or the um, interest and political will of the parties, but by political uh, considerations, especially from Bill Clinton, who did not want to be seen as getting the U.S. involved in a long-term operation and had his own electoral considerations in mind, um, but also just a lack of agreement more broadly among the various uh, European um, countries who were going to be involved in implementing the peace agreement. Uh, the international role can be broadly divided into the military role, uh, starting with the NATO implementation force, and then which evolved into the stabilization force. And this was really the peacekeepers, the boosts on the ground to try to create a secure and safe environment. Um, and then the civilian aspect of implementation, which included the Office of the High Representative, different organizations ranging from UNHCR to the OSCE to the International Police Task Force that was given a mandate to try to improve uh, the policing in the country as the police had been very much divided and um, uh, ethnically divided and used as a tool of a lot of the wartime operations and was seen as in need of substantial reform. <clears throat> And now, all this being said, while you, when you look through the Dayton Agreement, you can see that uh, the writers did try to put in a lot of different elements uh, that were seen to be needed in terms of rebuilding the state and rebuilding the state structures. Uh, there was the annex on the preservation of national monuments that was included in Annex 8, which was aimed at trying to help to rebuild and um, in the future protect some of the national monuments and uh, cultural heritage that had been so intentionally destroyed uh, during the war. Uh, it included elections in terms of having a mechanism of general and local elections that would be key in terms of handing over um, authority and local authority to, to the citizens of the country um, and, and many other annexes uh, throughout. 
And, and from the beginning, everyone you speak to who was involved in Dayton will point out that they never anticipated that the Dayton agreement, that the Dayton framework would be around for so long. Everybody believed that this would be a stepping stone towards future negotiations, future talks in a less heated environment. Um, in, in which a more rational system could be put into place, uh, either through some sort of a constitutional convention or a simple progression of normalcy over time in peacetime. Um, but unfortunately, that normalization and that sort of revision or rethinking of Dayton never really happened. Um, there were a lot of reasons for this, unfortunately. Some of the energy that we had initially seen uh, dissipated as, for example, uh, international European American attention first shifted to Kosovo in 1999 and afterwards. Then we saw the distractions uh, that came after 9-11 and American focus on Afghanistan, Iraq, and other parts of the world. Uh, then we saw the financial crisis. We kept seeing different crises come up, which basically kept distracting uh, lawmakers domestically and internationally from trying to go back and revisit some of the weaknesses in Dayton that we knew about for, from the beginning. Oops, let me just, uh, sorry. <clears throat> and, and so over this period of time, rather than seeing a continuous linear progression of reform in Bosnia, we saw a lot more fits and starts throughout. And this reflects both the domestic imperatives, but then also some of the international dynamics. Um, very broadly speaking, I, I like to look at the post-war international engagement in Bosnia in three broad stages. And, and when I have more time, I usually like to go into these in a bit more detail. But very briefly, uh, the first stage of international engagement was from the signing of the Dayton Agreement until just about early 1998. And this was where there was really the focus on uh, military implementation, Annex 1, some of the bricks and mortar uh, reconstruction, infrastructure redevelopment processes and starting to figure out how to create space to do more of the civilian elements. Um, the efforts to hold the first post-war elections demonstrated the weaknesses, um, some technical but mostly political in terms of working with domestic political actors. And so by late 1997, the Peace Implementation Council and others recognized that there was a need to push harder on some of the civilian il uh, implementation elements. And we saw the adoption of what became known as the bond powers, which from about 1998 led into the second phase of peace implementation, where we saw a much more robust, aggressive, some would say inappropriate role of some of the international players in trying to implement Dayton in both letter and in spirit. Um, this period of time was dominated by really two high representatives, uh, Wolfgang Petrich and then especially Patty Ashdown. And they played a much more aggressive role in trying to both um, exclude by removal of, um, of politicians and individuals who were seen as preventing uh, the implementation of the peace accords, uh, again, in letter and spirit, and also in pushing through the adoption of legislative frameworks to create a stronger state system, either through um, general legislation or the development of additional ministries and governmental bodies that would be able to ensure that the country would be able to move forward in terms of its transatlantic uh, integration efforts. And, and this period of time uh, was a, an optimistic time for people who were here, for many people who were here because we saw a lot of reforms being implemented. This is when we saw the establishment of single Ministry of Defense and one armed forces of Bosnia and Herzegovina, for example, something that had been unthinkable just a few years earlier. We saw reform in certain aspects of public administrations, um, in certain aspects of intelligence reform, uh, and in different aspects of taxation, all of which helped to create progressive incremental change aimed at trying to reduce some of the divisions within the country and set up a stronger framework for moving forward. However, this uh, progress uh, started to decline at first slowly and then rapidly, uh, beginning in 2006 uh, for a number of reasons. Um, 
First of all, you might have heard about the April package, and this was an effort um, that was led by the Americans to try to cr create a package of constitutional reforms that would remedy some of the weaknesses of the Dayton Constitution and would put it on a stronger footing to move forward in terms of its um, reform processes. And Ari will likely talk about this a bit, and I can talk about it a bit as well in, in the discussion period. But the April package was aimed at trying to fix some of the most egregious human rights problems in the Constitution, as well as some of the um, functionality issues, which had been detailed by both the Council of Europe's Venice Commission, but also um, acknowledged by uh, countless uh, local and external actors who were familiar with the situation. Um, the effort to negotiate this so-called April package of reforms had been ongoing for months, and unfortunately it failed to be adopted in April 2006 by just two votes uh, in the parliament. Um, and, and after this happened, we saw a downward um, spiral in terms of domestic um, incentives and interest in terms of reform, as well as international engagement in this issue. Now, now, the Constitution really has to be looked at not as the only tool at one's disposal, but, but the problem in Bosnia is that some of the constitutional elements really can be seen as a straitjacket um, that offers a set of very often contradictory incentives to the political actors who, are, who should be implementing it and trying to move the country forward. And unfortunately, while in theory, uh, there's nothing preventing this constitution from working. In practice, there has been little to no political will to allow this to happen. And so the, the big picture question we keep coming back to is that in the absence of domestic political will, can constitutional reform ever really happen? And if it can't, then is a country like Bosnia basically doomed to continuing to have this dysfunctional constitution? Um, following the April package and its failure, there were two subsequent efforts to try to amend the Constitution from a bottom-down process. Uh, one was called the Prude Process and the other was Bootmere, uh, both of which were primarily led by the Europeans and both of which were weaker and weaker than the previous and they all ultimately failed. So we continued to be stuck with the same Constitution. Um, at the same time, in 2006, 7, 8, there were some efforts uh, from the bottom up to try to fix the Dayton Constitution by a number of different local think tanks funded by the Americans, the Swiss, and others. Uh, these had more transparent processes, uh, had more engagement by citizens, and a bit more effort at building constituencies of reform. Um, but unfortunately, what's been consistently lacking has been like a top-down, bottom-up process that would be able to squeeze the middle layer of um, domestic politicians uh, to basically try to move things forward and accept some changes. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say that turkeys don't vote for Christmas. And this really is a, a, a very... Uh, blithe way to note that politicians in this country recognize that this is a system that benefits them. There's very little incentive to change the pol political system here because the three dominant uh, nationalist ruling groups have benefited quite well either as parties or individuals and have not really seen any interest uh, for themselves in trying to fix the constitution. <clears throat> Um, I see I'm already coming up on my time, but I want to close with some thoughts on some lessons learned from this process, uh, not just again for Bosnia, but in terms of international engagement in ending wars and building a peace in general. Um, the first one is that the interim can very easily become permanent and solidify. Um, while I can understand that there's an interest in creating some small steps of progress and then moving forward, unless there's continue and for, uh, continuous forward movement, it's extremely easy for um, bad halfway solutions to consolidate and take on a momentum and a set of interests um, of their own. Uh, we can see this very clearly with the Dayton Constitution, which is, has now 
created around it a group of political players who all for different motivations want to keep this system and will resist any change. But we can also see it in other ways. Uh, one of the other good examples are the two schools under one roof uh, system of educational segregation, which at the beginning was seen as an important in, uh, first step towards trying to cut down the school segregation, but now almost 15 years later has solidified and created a momentum, a negative momentum all its own. So, so people and negotiators and diplomats who are engaged in negotiating peace treaties need to recognize that they, they need to be very cautious that interim solutions don't end up solidifying. Um, ending a war is different than building a peace. Um, Richard Holbrook's book was not titled to build a country, it was entitled to end a war. And the dynamics and the motivations and the resources available to build a peace and build and strengthen a state and all of the governance uh, institutions therein is very different than separating artillery and dealing with just military implementation. Um, a third question that I think is very difficult to um, discuss, but it's very important, is that uh, there are perils of a frozen conflict. Um, one of the articles I shared for reading is an analysis of whether or not Bosnia can be seen as a frozen conflict and what that means um, for all of the parties to the conflict, but also for the citizens living here. And in 1995, while the motivation was to end the war and to, in, to end the intense human suffering that was happening, the fact that there was no single victor is something that we're still seeing today. Uh, you can talk to any of the three main uh, nationalist groups here and they will all see that they uh, didn't win what they wanted and that a compromise was necessary. But in the absence of a constructive compromise, uh, we're left with what really can only be termed as a frozen conflict, which is quite dysfunctional. <clears throat> um, and then next, I would say that it's extremely important that if embedding a constitution or different governance rules into a peace agreement, that there be that there be an effort to ensure that the system has either internal or external possibilities for change and also for internal accountability. Uh, one of the biggest complaints that we've been hearing for years and that is consistently noted in public opinion polls is that Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, suffers from rampant corruption and a lack of a justice institution, uh, which reflects the lack of accountable institutions um, governing the system. And, and this creates a negative incentive in the country um, for change and makes citizens lose faith in the process in general. Um, I would just close my lessons learned review by noting that there's an unfortunate tendency, especially by the European Union, to assume that uh, stagnation is actually stability. What we've seen since 2006 is not stability, it's simply stagnation. And unfortunately, that stagnation has um, embedded uh, among the citizenry as well as the political parties and made it difficult to envision trying to move forward with any sort of a constructive way. Uh, supporting the status quo was not neutrality. Uh, this is a challenge we've been seeing from the EU and the Americans who have come to sort of see that only the elites are their partners, that the elected officials are the only uh, legitimate interlocutors. And when you look at the problems in the electoral system, when you look at um, ongoing and continuous allegations of uh, patronage and blatant election fraud, one has to wonder whether or not the international community has picked the wrong partner and should instead be focusing on citizens instead of some of the political elites. And, and then in terms of the bigger picture, one has to wonder if a constitutional structure in which a fourth group of citizens is systematically disadvantaged um, compared to the three constituent peoples can, can ever be a rational, functional, and rights-based uh, system. <clears throat> In, in terms of some closing food for thought, when I look back to 1990, 1991, and I see where we are now, I, I wonder if the arc of Bosnia-Herzegovina shows us some trends that we might not really want to admit to. Um, since Brexit, since the rise of Trump, since the rise of a lot of these different extremisms, unfortunately, it seems like a lot of countries in the West are getting more like Bosnia rather than Bosnia becoming more and more like some of the countries in the West towards which we thought that the country could move while making this journey. 
And this has created a playing field in which we see a lot of different agendas being pursued um, by different actors within Bosnia Herzegovina and regionally. Uh, we're also seeing a shift in some of the regional geopolitics. Um, I think the, the focus on geopolitics shouldn't be overstated, but it also can't be understated. And the lack of demonstrable improvement in people's lives and, and in terms of the lack of clear forward progress in the country, we've seen a real space for different powers to come in and to sort of sow different visions, different narratives, or pursue some of their own very transactional interests. We can look at Russia, China, Turkey, but then also uh, some of the countries in the Gulf. Um, perhaps the biggest challenge to Bosnia-Herzegovina right now is brain drain, or actually maybe brain rejection, as we're seeing more and more people just leaving. After 25 years of trying, even those most patriotic people who are committed to Bosnia are finally giving up and feeling that there's no perspective here. Uh, this is not just an economic issue. Uh, we're seeing families with decent jobs leaving because they don't trust that the country will be able to offer their children the schools, education, and future perspective that they want. And, and this is very troubling. Driving around the country, you can see a visible uh, decline in medium and smaller sized towns um, from just a few years ago. <clears throat> um, the, the migrant crisis is affecting the country as obviously uh, the COVID-19 crisis, but both of these are really just serving to magnify the existing weaknesses as opposed to being specific, specific and distinct challenges. Um, I personally think that Dayton is an evolutionary dead end and that the country um, cannot move forward with it. And perhaps we can talk about that more during Arif's discussion as well. Um, in the reading materials, I provided a couple of things to get people thinking and to lead into Arif's presentation. I think Jonathan Rawls' Val of Ignorance gives us an interesting model for how we can think about discussions about what we want the country, what citizens want the country to look like. And I think Piotr Stomka gives some very interesting food for thought in terms of what social change looks like and how you can try to create an environment in which social change in a peaceful manner might be possible. Um, and then just in closing, um, this, at the beginning of this discussion, when we were talking about films, um, I'm, I'm happy to note that I've got a documentary film about the Dayton Constitution um, that's coming out this year, and I just found out that it was accepted at the Sarajevo Film Festival. I put a link here for you to take a look at, and you can see what the premise is. And I'm hoping that this will be provide a different way of thinking about Bosnia, about thinking about Dayton, about trying to remind viewers that peace agreements are not just about the warlords sitting at the table, but they have a real impact on the lives of the normal uh, men and women who fought the war and who have to live with the consequences. And so after years of trying to raise attention to Dayton, Bosnia through uh, policy papers, writing and academic work, um, I'm hoping that perhaps uh, trying to do so from film could lead to a fruitful discussion. So I'm sorry if I overstepped my time, but I will stop there and take any questions. I'm, I'm unmuted. My, thank you so much, Valerie. I was aware of the time, uh, but I always enjoy, enjoy listening to Valerie. So I, for my own benefit, I let her finish her very interesting um, thoughts and analysis of uh, uh, consequences of Dayton for Bosnian society and politics. Um, just to be aware of the time, uh, I saw that Holly has a question. Holly, should we allow uh, Arif to uh, get on because he might actually answer many of your questions because it is so complimentary what he has to say to Valerie. So maybe by this we will be very efficient and then if you still need to ask this question, uh, we will of course give you